I think one of the greatest things about those firms is the training that they provide, particularly early in your career, was because I was kind of poached from somebody I had studied with. I think over the years, it's been patience and learning to listen, but also learning of other people's experiences. Like we all tried to figure out about Y2K. <laughs> it was done to me, not by me. It was probably the role I learned the most in my career. It was right. the best and the worst role of my <laughs> yeah. entire career. I, right. um, I was worried that if I did, I would never get out. Change is hard mm. and doing things outside your comfort zone um, it's difficult. And when I finished and I moved on, I learnt that I could do any role I wanted to do. Today's guest is Andrea Bell. But who is Andrea Bell? You certainly won't find her on LinkedIn. Andrea is one of Australia's most outstanding CIOs, most recently with EBOS Group and previously with Anderson Consulting, South Pacific Tires and SCA Health. You will learn in today's show how Andrea considered a career in the army, how she unknowingly moved away from tech and into a supply planning role, before returning to tech and ascending to CIO. Andrea's story is one of courage and being prepared to step into the unknown. A humble, modest and introverted leader, Andrea is one of Australia's most accomplished tech titans. Hey Andrea, thank you for for joining us today on the podcast. Um, You're you're actually quite a tricky person to research. Uh, I discovered that you're no longer on LinkedIn, um, which I think actually makes you, or today's conversation, even more interesting because you're probably the most mysterious and elusive CIO in Australia right now. Um, so, and I know you're currently wrapping things up with EBOS, uh, and you've had a fantastic career there spanning 30 years. Um, and it all started with a degree in accounting and computing at Swinburne. I did. Um, yes. So who or what inspired that course selection right back then? Uh no one, really. It was actually more a, I have no idea what I want to do. Yeah. And I went to a girls' tech. I learned how to type and yep. sew and cook. Right. And I was supposed to go to secretarial school. And I didn't want to do that because it only went to year 11. Yeah. So I did the, uh, the TAFE version of TOP and I just fell in, you know, bookkeeping and I was good at maths and I was good at school. So I kind of just fell into it. But when I finished Year 12, I applied for a couple of courses, but I didn't apply for very many because I really yep. didn't know what I wanted to do. And I figured business is the basis of everything. Yep. Therefore, even if I didn't use it, it would be great to have in life. Yeah, so right. I applied for it, but knew I was going to defer. And in fact, I applied to join the army to go to, yeah, right. yeah, to do officer school in the Australian army. So was that always the dream? No. To no? No, okay. I just didn't know what to do. I looked at customs and I, I rang the Air Force and they asked if I could take, you know, shorthand and type. Yeah. I said, no. Uh, so I applied for the Army and I got through all the recruiting, but they asked me to... I was 18, I just finished year 12. Yeah. So they asked me to just go knock about in the world for a year and grow up. Yeah, um, right. And okay. in that time, all my friends were at uni, so I sort of went, oh, shucks, I suppose I better go. So I went and I fell into computing when I was doing my business degree. Yeah. But I still started that course with no idea of what I was going to do with it. And, and towards the end um, of that course, did you have a kind of career in mind? Was there something that you were starting to think about? Did it help form an opinion? Once I was in there, that it, um, you know, I was at uni, gosh, nearly probably 40 years ago. Um, it was... The first year was a very common year, and so you did a lot of business subjects, so you really could figure out what you wanted to do. So I did some computing in that, I did accounting in that. So I did a major, I have a double major in accounting and computing, um, because I I sort of figured I would do both, and I enjoyed the computing side more. And that's where (laughs) I was introduced really to what was then uh, Anderson Consulting, or Arthur Anderson. Um, because I did my, what was called a sandwich year then, in the middle of my degree. Ah, So I did an internship with them for 12 months in the middle of my degree. And I had a choice to go accounting or computing. And I figured, well, computing sounded like more fun, so I would try that. And (laughs) so that kind of led me into it. But it was never planned. Is is sandwich year still a thing? Do kids still do that? Yeah, they do. In the industry? Yes. I I remember, uh, yeah, back in my time, that was really common and really popular and actually a good way to get exposure into industry. And to really see if you enjoy doing what 
you're studying. Yeah. Um, so it's my son has just you know he did a um, an engineering a product design degree and he did a, a year of work experience in the middle of that degree. So it is yeah it's still quite a thing yeah. that happens, particularly Swinburne. I think RMIT do it a lot. Yeah. And it's I guess from an organisational perspective, it's, it's it's a great way to recruit. Obviously, they Anderson recruited you off the back of that yes. process, yes. Um, and and got you to come back. And yep. I think you spent a couple of years there, from from what I read, um, as a analyst programmer. I yeah, think you described it. Were you a natural programmer? Yeah, I loved programming. Yeah, I okay. still do. I, yeah, I have a quite. I think that's why I like accounting. I have a very logical brain, and to me, programming it's really easy. It's just logical and common sense to me, but. So what, what what did that role involve? Because you were, you were in a consulting firm. So were you sort of working on specific client projects? Yeah, different clients. So you, depending upon what they had, I would go out to different clients and work on big ERP projects and implementations and programming work. And Yeah, yeah great. great. So did, how did that, do you think, set you up for a future career in tech? I think one of the greatest things about those firms is the training that they provide, particularly early in your career. Yeah. So then we used to go out to um, Chicago, we would go to St. Charles and we would go to this big training academy that yeah. Arthur Anderson had that all people globally would go to. Uh, and it was the greatest base in training that I mm. think you could get. But also starting in consulting meant I developed a really strong sense of customer and customer focus. Yeah. So when I went back into industry to work for organisations, I understood who my customer was yep. and how to treat them as a customer, not to think that I knew more than they did. Um, so I, for me, I think Anderson's was just such a fantastic starting point yep. of my career to really learn and to, to really respect the customer and to get that, that grounding. Uh, and, that, and that's interesting because after you left Anderson Consulting, you went to South Pacific Tyres, which was, uh, I believe, Dunlop and Goodyear. Yes. Was that a merger uh, or yes. a, a joint venture, sorry, between yes. between the two? And it was something that I actually see quite often with tech leaders in particular. They, they kind of start a career in consulting uh, and then move into industry. Yeah. Um, and that's what I was going to ask you. How did you find that transition? It's it's interesting. I I missed seeing the outcomes of what I did in consulting. You yeah, right. finished a project and you moved on to another client and I never really got to see how what I did impacted the client and whether it was successful or not. Yeah. So I went into industry because I really wanted to have that end-to-end -end view and to, to get that feed, almost that feedback all the time about whether what I was doing was good or not and helping. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was a little bit hard to get out of the formality of being yeah. in consulting when you go in industry, you know, this, you know, the suits and, you know, in my yeah. day, women didn't wear pants to work when they worked in consulting. It was skirts <laughs> and navy blue suits and things like that. Um, so it was getting out of that formality and getting into the cultures of an organisation because when you're in consulting, you're at the client all the time. You yeah. often feel m like you belong to the client more than you do the consulting company that you mm. work for. Yeah, Whereas interesting. when you're in industry, you, you, you then become, you know, you help develop and add to the culture of the organisation. So it, it is very different. Yeah, that is interesting. And that you're obviously very successful at South Pacific Tires because I, I saw in the, the 12 years you were there, you had seven roles, yeah. um, which is uh, obviously quite a go-getter with, yeah. with, with your progression. Yeah. Uh, I think you joined, I, I read, as a, a kind of analyst and yeah. you've ended up as the IT relationship manager. Yes. Um, how did those opportunities come about for that progression? Um, I think... It was just we had a lot to do there. It was a it was a manufacturing business, so it really yep. developed my love of manufacturing and the sort of the whole warehouse and product movement environment. And most of my career has been in that space. Yeah, um, I, I think being there for such a long time, I was there for like thirteen years. Had both my kids there. Um, you you sort of every two or three years, you, you're growing and you step up. And so they provided those opportunities to yep. step up and do different things and move around different teams and get different experience. And so it just evolved from that. And then when I came back after having my first child, I sort of stepped more into a management role. And yeah. I probably hung around the last couple of years really just waiting to finish having my family. And so it was it was a bit bitsy in the back yeah, end okay. while I was waiting to just finish having my kids. I think what I was interested in with it, though, is um, did you proactively go looking for those opportunities or was the business kind of bringing them bringing them to you? Because, again, I'm thinking about people trying to advance their careers. 
and they're kind of sitting there thinking, you know, do yeah. I put my hand up and say, you know, I'm interested in other roles and opportunities or, you know, how do those opportunities kind of come knocking? It's probably a bit of both. I, yeah. I think in the first instance, it's they, you sort of, they're given to you. You're working hard, you're being recognised for it and then you're given those opportunities. Um, as you then establish your reputation, then it was it was a bit more of seeing where there was potential opportunity and having that discussion and sort of putting your hand up to, yeah. hey, well, what if I did this or I could do that and, and looking for them. Um, but particularly in those first 10, 15 years of your career, I think there's a lot where it's seeing how hard you're working, seeing where your potential is and companies often are steering you down those paths. And I think that first part of my career was more of that. Yeah, okay, so kind of being allowed to be guided by the people you trusted and believed yeah. in you to, to, to get to those. Yeah. Um, one of my favourite bits of your resume uh, was reading your achievements in that role. And uh, specifically it said, graduate diploma in information systems, master's in information systems and two kids. Yeah. Right? And I love this. Because <laughs> I thought, well... It, that is an achievement. So in 12, 13 years, you managed seven roles, a couple of post-grad qualifications yeah. and, and a couple of kids. I was busy. <laughs> you, you were very busy. Um, I'm just going to start with the educational highlights. Um, how, how do you feel that post-grad study kind of set you up for the future? It cemented probably more my tech knowledge to some degree, but yeah. it moved much more into management and leadership and then gave me much more of a grounding, a theoretical grounding in those spaces, which was okay. timely for where my career would then go in those subsequent years. Um, but it was, it was more the interactions with other people that I met there as opposed to what you learn in the actual course. It was the, okay. the work experience working with people from different organisations at different levels. You did lots of project work, um, lots of research projects. Um, and so it was more that what I gained from other people and their experiences that I took away. And in fact, one of the people I studied with, in fact, was who tapped me on the shoulder and the reason I left um, there you go. Uh, South Pacific Tires and went over to Sansella was because I was kind of poached from somebody I had studied with. So it was more those experiences, I think, for me that were valuable as opposed to what I actually learnt through the course. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Because that's easy to overlook, isn't it? Sometimes you focus on the educational outcomes and the, and the learning outcomes, but actually the network yeah. of being outside the four walls of your organisation, as you say, can be quite powerful to... Yeah. Yeah, just learn from other experiences, but equally to, to open the door for other opportunities as, as well outside of that. Um, two kids and some maternity leaves as well thrown in the mix there. Yes. Yep. How, how, did, how do you think becoming a parent shaped you as a leader? Gosh, that's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think over the years it's been patience and learning to listen um, but also learning of other people's experiences. Um, you sort of have to be patient with kids and give them space, I found. And, and I have two boys and they're very active. Um, so juggling everything, juggling what was important for them, juggling what was important for me, for my family, for my career, it, it makes you get organised, for one. Yeah. Um, but I think it also helps you work out what's important in your life yeah. as well and then working out where you, where you have to let some things go and let other people take care of it. And that's actually okay. Yeah. It's okay to let go because you surround yourself with good people and therefore I could focus time on my kids as well as focus time on my career. And I was very, very fortunate because my husband was very, very hands-on at home with the kids. He had his own business. He could move it around to help look after the kids. So, in fact, he became more a house dad, which right. meant I could focus much more on my own career as well. Um, but I think it's as the kids got older, um, it's the amount they taught me that made me soften probably in more ways than I would probably care to admit. Yeah, okay. And how did you feel yourself about returning from maternity leave? I know that can be quite anxiety-inducing <laughs> for some. Um, how, no, how I was ready to... Oh, you were ready to get back to work? <laughs> I was okay. ready yeah. to go back. I'm not great at... Um, I have to be very, very occupied yeah. um, and doing things all the time. And I was, I was quite ready. It was... It was um, 
I loved being at home with my kids and my husband and I had great fun when we were both there looking after them when we had the second. Um, but it was, I, I, I just, there was things that I was missing that I needed. Yeah, okay. Um, another achievement you mentioned on your resume, which uh, did make me laugh out loud, actually, I'll confess. Uh, Y2K planning. Oh, man. <laughs> I forgot about Y2K until I saw that. We on all your tried to forget about <laughs> Y2K. <laughs> what, what was going on for you at that time? Uh, it was just crazy the panic in the mm. environment of what was going to happen and that everything was going to stop and planes were going to fall out of the sky and, yeah. you know, just. Toasters were going to stop working. Yeah, everything yeah. was just, you know, you, you were waiting for the clock to turn over and yeah. you sort of sat there watching and then waiting for the big bangs to go on around you and there was just nothing. Yeah. Just nothing. Do you think, though, um, kind of being part of that prepared you for things in the future? You know, there's obviously been subsequent COVID being one of them, for example. There's kind of major events. Um, yeah, just, just curious. You know, do you think that kind of played into it in some way? I wonder whether, I mean, I kind of say Y2K didn't have the effect because everyone did plan really well for it. Yeah. You know, we did have to make a lot of changes to systems. And so we planned very well to make sure that we weren't negatively affected. Um, I think that after that, and even with COVID, we probably never really expected it was ever going to happen, particularly like it did. Yeah. Um, but we, in particularly in tech, I think we're very good planners. Yeah. We're, we're very good at crisis management. We're very good at moving fast. Yeah. And, and that's what we certainly did for COVID. And that's how we got through it was we, we saw it coming. We moved the moment we got a hint of where it was going um, and it was that preparation that we did very quickly that meant as an organisation we were not negatively impacted. Yeah, fantastic. On, um, on leaving South Pacific Ties, uh, you moved to SCH Health. Uh, I've kind of classified it. went through a different, various different iterations through, through that from what I could read uh, and different guises. Yep. Um, and what stood out for me actually was that when you joined them, you moved away from tech. You, decided, you, you got away. And uh, to all things, you went to supply planning. I did. I did. What, what, what was that all about? What, what kind of inspired that shift? It was done to me, not by me. Right, okay, yeah. <laughs> so my manager at the time, had, uh, who was head of supply chain, had asked me if I would do it, and I said no several yep. times. I wasn't a planner. What did I know about planning? <laughs> I was a tech girl. Um, and the organisation chart came out, and my name was on it in that role. And I why? Yeah. He's like, well, you hesitated at some point. So I thought, you know, you weren't <laughs> quite sure. Um, so I didn't choose to do it. Yeah. But he knew better than I did. Um, and he understood, which it took me a little bit for me to learn, was that it wasn't about my supply planning knowledge that I was there. It was my general understanding of process yeah. and my understanding of the organisation and my ability to learn. Um, and it was much more about me understanding that about myself and that I didn't need to know everything in order to be able to run a team and in order to be able to make improvement in the organisation, I had to lead. Yeah. Um, and it took me a while to learn that, and once I worked it out, um, I learned a lot. I, it was probably the role I learned the most in my career. It was right. the best and the worst role <laughs> of my yeah. entire career, I think. Yeah, great. And again, probably a bit like your consulting days, it got you back closer to the customer. It did. In terms of the real coalface of, of, of where, where things were happening. Yeah. Um, eventually, you came back to tech I did. after a few years. I did. Um, was that always the plan? I Again, I, again, I didn't want to. Right. Um, I was worried that if I did, I would never get out of tech again. Um, and again, I was asked to do it, and I said no. Yep. Did you hesitate but this time? I did, <laughs> apparently. Um, but I, I worked with a couple of people that were very good at predicting for me what I should do. And they were right. They were absolutely right. And our head of HR at the time um, sent me off to a consultant to have a career discussion Right. And he made me do an, an exercise which was about really looking at, really at, you know, at what age I thought I would die. Right. An abnormal age, not an ordinary yeah. age. 
and what my life would be. And when I looked back on my life at that point, what would I want to be proud of that I had achieved or what would I regret not having done? And there was a whole exercise around it. But I think for me, the, the point of it was, was actually about being honest mm. with myself yeah. about my own ambitions and career objectives and what I really wanted to achieve in my career. Yeah. And through that, being honest with myself, admitting to myself that I would like to do a CIO role. Mm. I would like to be able to say at the end that I could and I did. Um, and so I went back to work and said, okay, I'll do it. Do you think that gave you permission to have that ambition? It gave me, it gave me permission to, I think so, yes, and to be honest. To be honest yeah. with myself. I didn't need to say it out loud to anybody else. I think yeah. in that era um, it, it wasn't the dumb thing for women to be ambitious. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we wouldn't speak of it. But we have our own private ambitions of things we would like to achieve. And so it was really about honesty and yep. admitting that to myself, that I did want to do that and I did want to prove to myself that I could achieve it and I could do it. Um, and so I, it was a it was an Asia-Pacific role that I was being asked to do and I went back and said, OK, I'll do it. And, I, and I'm glad I did. It was, it was really the stepping stone then into senior management and yeah. into sort of more international roles. Um, and again, I learned a lot from doing it. So, you know, that one company probably then set me up for, for what I did. Those two moves were probably the greatest career decisions I made. Yeah, pretty pivotal. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the biggest learning from them was change is hard and mm. doing things outside your comfort zone, um, it's difficult. Yeah. And people often will choose not to change their careers to do something that they're not absolutely skilled to do. Yeah. And I didn't want to do the planning role because I, I wasn't a planner. Mm. But I learned so much in that role. And when I finished and I moved on, um, I learned that I could do any role I wanted to do mm. because I, I had recognised within myself I could learn whatever I needed to know and I didn't need to know everything. Yeah. There's plenty of people around that, that have the knowledge that I need. I just needed to know how to draw that knowledge and bring it in and create good teams and, and drive good teams and get outcomes. Yeah. And so when my, um, when my CEO at um, SCA waltzed into my office and said, hey, we're going to float the business. <laughs> what do you reckon? Can you take <laughs> care of that for us? Like, I'm a tech girl. What do I know? Yeah. Um, Sure, I can do that. Yeah. We can figure out what we need to do. And we did. And that was a great experience. It had nothing to do with technology. But I got to work on preparing a prospectus and validating it and rebranding a company and finding share registers and all sorts of things um, that I would never have had that experience to do had I not done those roles that taught me that I didn't need to have a piece of paper that told me I was skilled to do something. I just needed to know how to ask questions and how to learn yeah. what I needed to know and have the courage to go do it. It's incredibly empowering. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that realisation you don't have to have all the answers, just the questions. Yes, yes. It's um, yeah, such a wonderful story, by the way. And uh, <laughs> um, when you moved into that IT director role, you, as you mentioned there, you had the APAC remit. Oh. Um, how did you find that transition sort of working internationally with different cultures? It was fun. Yeah. Um, and again, I think it was about asking questions. So my predecessor was still sort of there that um, he was great to guide me to, you know, we went to China and to teach me some of the etiquette of dealing yeah. with different cultures, you know, how to accept a business card <laughs> in the right way, um, things like that, that you don't know unless somebody you know, you research it or somebody is there to just give you a guiding hand. Yeah. Um, but it was it was a great experience, a great years. You know, I, I, I did a lot of travel in those years. Um, but it was it was a, it was a really good experience. Yeah, fantastic. And in as you mentioned there, you went through the I, IPO mm -hmm. uh, and um, you came out of that as CIO. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to your ambition, which is fantastic. How did that differ from an IT director? It, it didn't. It didn't. <laughs> it's just, it was just a recog more recognised title. Um, but it, it meant that I had the, you know, I got the, the seat at the table. I, yep. you know, reported to the CEO. 
so it was um, it was again a little bit of a step up into that executive space. Yep. Uh, much more, even though I was working, I had three bosses in the director role, and I was working for a boss in Europe and one in China, and so that was actually more complicated. Yeah. But it, sometimes the title <coughs> just helps to get things done. Yes. It's yeah, sort okay. of more industry recognised. People understand what it means. Um, yep. But getting the seat at the table also means you get a lot more breadth of understanding about what goes on in an, in an organisation. Yeah, right. Yeah, c- a kind of uh, a broader commercial understanding of, yes. of the drivers. Yeah. Um, as you shifted into these senior leadership roles, who who mentored you through that process? Um, really, the the head, our head of HR at the time who had encouraged me to take the director role, he had been very instrumental in that and helping me in those spaces. But it, particularly at SCA, it was in the era and the years when I was there, it was very male. Um, so there was a lot more on myself and where I could just go find assistance and help and learn. Um, I joined the National Association of Women um, in Operations and so that also Angela Tatlis rang that. Um, and so she's a, she was a great uh, person to kind of you know, prod and push and why aren't you doing this and why aren't you doing that? So those kinds of organisations were fantastic to just give you a bit of a push up when you needed it. Yeah, great. And in um, in 2015, you joined EBOS Group. I did. Uh, as CIO, uh, where you've you've been in that role until recently. Um, what When you joined, what did you hope to achieve in that role? I needed something more from what I had. I think it was time I left. SCA, um, I had done everything I could do there. I needed a different challenge. I needed to go back into an organisation where there was a lot more that I needed to actually do and improve. Yeah. And um, healthcare is quite a different organisation. They're a wholesale, uh, ma- major wholesale distributor. So it was still within my supply chain space. Yeah. Um, but it was it was quite different from my background of automotive and manufacturing. Yeah. Um, and, and fast-moving consumer goods. So it was quite a different industry. And so that gave me, again, another opportunity to learn, but also to make a difference, to, to build a team and to make internal improvements in the organisation. Yeah, great. And you, uh, you were in that role for eight years, mm-hmm. uh, which is roughly about two and a half, three times the average tenure for a CIO. Okay. Um, how, did you, how did you stay fresh in that role? It moved. I mean, yeah. EBOS changed a lot over those years. It was continuously growing. Yeah. So it was just constantly stepping up into the next thing that was going on. You know, the whole security space really came to the forefront over the last eight years in a massive way. And so it's just keeping in touch of what was going on in industry and then um, – just adapting to that but also a lot of CIO groups out there so I'm not great at networking um, I'm much more introverted than I am in getting which is why you can't find me on LinkedIn yeah. um, then then really getting out there I, I don't do the speaker circuit and things like that so but I did join some um, a CIO groups and so really learning from other CIOs about what was going on and, and using them as sounding boards was a really yeah that's great yeah it was a great learning and when you reflect back on the last eight years, what, what do you think has been your biggest success? I think just navigating all the change that we went through, um, building a team to do that, and the amount of change we made within the organisation, um, I think was, um, was you know, I, it's a bit scary. We often don't look back, but when you yeah. do and you see just how much you've achieved and how much you've done... Um, and we did it without hurting the organisation. And we imp- made a lot of implementation changes, but we really didn't hurt the organisation much in the process. And that's always a great thing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. We've spoken a lot there, sort of step by step through your career. Mm. Um, if I was to think a bit more or ask you to think a bit more broadly, uh, have you got any career regrets? Not really. Probably just not taking a post in overseas somewhere is yeah, probably okay. the one thing that I that I missed and it was just opportunity the timing of opportunities just wasn't right yep. you know the wrong time with the age of my kids um, or just just things got in the way of it 
Um, so that's probably the only thing that I haven't really done that I kind of say I would have liked to have done. It's lucky you're not on LinkedIn because you probably now get a dozen messages <laughs> with the Office for Overseas Jobs. Um, have a, um, which role would you say has kind of pushed you most outside your comfort zone? Oh, absolutely, the supply planning role. Yeah. Yeah, I, I knew nothing. It's you know I got abused in that role more than any other role. If, abused? If, but, and, and that in itself was a great learning. Well, when you're responsible for all of products that are coming out of a fast-moving right, consumer correct. goods manufacturer when there's an out of stock um, you you tend to take the blame for that um, but you then you know I learned a lot about how to deal with that how to not make it personal how to focus on the facts uh, and solve the problem not take on board all the emotion that goes with it and that's yeah. that stood me in good stead over a lot of years to be able to put that emotion aside and just deal with the fact on the table and solve yeah. a problem yeah great and as, as someone's working through or up to the career ladder, um, often it's hard to understand or know really what the rung above looks like. Yeah. Um, how would you sort of in, uh, encourage or recommend somebody learn uh, about what the next role looks like from a progression point of view? To be open-minded, I think, about it and keep your eye open across different roles in an organisation. Don't, don't just look within what you think is your skill set think much more broadly about what your skills truly are and look broadly across an organisation. A lot of people, you know, if you work in accounting, will only look at roles in accounting. Yeah. Whereas when you have a finance background, you can go into commercial roles, you can go into sales roles, you can do yeah. so many different things. But it's being willing to step outside that comfort zone and to be a bit courageous and go and do something that's completely outside of what you think your skill set is um, and look much more laterally at what your skills are and therefore how you could apply that across an organisation. It's much easier for an organisation that you're in already to take a risk on you if they know you and they trust you yep. than it is to go to a brand new organisation and step outside your comfort zone into an area where you have no experience. It's much harder for them to take a risk on you. Yep. But if you're in a company and they already trust you, they're much more willing to do yeah. it. Yeah, but that makes you, sense. You've just got to look broadly and then ask. Talk yeah. to people and just talk to those people in leaders in those spaces and make it known that that's what you'd like to do. And that's interesting because it's something I noted actually is throughout our conversation you've talked about different guides being in different businesses that guided you to a role or yeah. encouraged you or, or nudged you to a role. And that's, I guess, the importance of the internal network as well as the external network and, and investing in those relationships. Uh, and it sounds like that's something that you've kind of proactively done through your career. I've probably done it more internally than externally, yeah. which is probably also why I've stayed in organisations for such a long mm. time. And I've done a lot of different roles within those organisations. Yeah. Um, because I have probably worked more internally. And even with the planning role, I could walk into the room in a conference of senior managers and know everyone in the room. Yep. And I knew what they did. I could go and talk to them. Um, and I think that meant I had a, a great understanding of the organisation, which also helped me then do the IPO, because if I didn't have that, I wouldn't have yep. had that opportunity either. So I think internally, for me, the internal network was much more powerful for me um, to just move my career around an organisation. Yeah. yeah, great. And what, uh, what do you enjoy most about being CIO? Knowing what's going on. Yeah. I, I love all the nooks and crannies of what's happening in an organisation. I, I, I love the projects. I love the, the change. I love change. I think change is invigorating. Mm -hmm. And um, it makes work interesting. Yeah. So I like the fact that I get to understand all of that. And I get to know what's happening. I get to get involved in all those things. And I get to open up those opportunities and that fun to my team and watch them grow. I, you know, I love watching my team mm -hmm. learn and grow and go on to bigger and better things. You know, I always say I'd rather have a team of people that everyone's trying to poach yeah. um, because they've grown and they've learned and they've outgrown what they do. Yeah, um, fantastic. Yeah. Um, final kind of CIO type question. Uh, if you had a, if you had one piece of, of uh, if you had one piece of singular sage advice that you were to give to the future generation of tech, what would it be? Be courageous yeah. and think 
outside of mainstream. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. A couple of slightly different questions. Um, we were talking about reading earlier, and uh, for you, I think you said it was escapism. <laughs> to yes. get, to yeah. get away from the day job and business yeah. and leadership. Um, what's, uh, what's your recommended read for someone looking to escape? I read a book quite quite a long time ago, and I think I've read it a couple of times. I am a repeat reader of books. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was called, I think it was called The Boys in the Boat. Okay. Uh, and it's um, based around an um, college rowing crew in the US um, at who went to a race in the Olympics and it's just their journey through it and it's a great leadership book it's a yeah. great yeah it's a really good read there's a lot to take out of it mm. it's not a tech book but yeah. there's a lot of technology in it you know you learn a lot about rowing and yeah. rowing boats but it's much more the story of the individuals in it um, it's a really it's a really fascinating read yeah great thank yeah. you um, I also noticed that you like to bake. I do. Right. I do. So if you're going to go on MasterChef, mm-hmm. what would be on the menu? Uh, I do make a pretty mean pav. Right. I yeah. have to say. Um, or a good old-fashioned, this time of year, a good old-fashioned homemade Christmas pudding. Yeah, right. Perfect. Yeah. You can't beat it. We know where to come now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look, thank you so much for sharing your story today. Um, it has, you know, it's, it's always insightful to learn the journeys that people took, and uh, uh, and thank you for being brave enough to share some of that stuff. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Cheers.